So, first of all, I'd just like to find out who we've got in the room. I said we're talking about leadership. So, bear with me. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands a couple of times. So, raise your hand if you're a leader in an organization. Mm, thank you. Raise your hand if you're a leader outside of work. A few of each. So now, raise your hand if you're the leader of your own life. Hey, we're all leaders. <laughs> Fantastic. So now I know I have the right audience. Okay, so I said I'm here to talk to you about sustainably effective leadership. And I'll just give you an outline of what I intend to talk to you about. I'm going to explain to you what my definition of sustainably effective leadership is. I'm going to then explore the big picture. Why does it even matter at all? I'll then tell you a personal story as to why it matters to me. And you're going to explore why it matters to you as leaders in any type of organization or at least as leaders of your own life. And in your folders, you'll find a one-pager. Um, it might be good if you get that out now. It says Triple H Tracker at the top. Partway through my talk, you're going to be filling that in. So don't worry about it now, but at least have it to hand. So we're going to explore why it matters in all those different ways, and then try to agree on a new definition of success that's appropriate for the 21st century. And I have defined my version of that definition of success as being happy. And it was interesting that Sophia was talking about all those things that Aristotle said about happiness. So about happiness, health, and high performance. And how having that broader definition of success can help us to find balance and be more sustainable as a leader. And then within that definition of success, I'm going to focus more deeply on one element, on the health element and give you a few tips. So what I'm hoping you'll go away with today is an understanding of what sustainably effectiveness means for you, an understanding of why that matters for you. You'll have a tracking sheet that you can use to hold yourself accountable in terms of finding balance and sustainability in your life. And hopefully you'll have a few tips of what you can do to maintain that sustainability. So what's my definition of sustainably effective leadership? Well, it's a leader, whether that's a leader of your own life or a leader in any form of organization, who is thriving and who has a definition of success that means that they're successful in all areas of their life, not just in one. It's a leader who continues to grow so that they can stay relevant and not become a dinosaur. And it's a leader who's effective over the long term, so they can continue to make their difference year after year. So that's my definition of sustainable leadership. So I'd like to, I'm quite good at coaches, I think, at asking the question, why does it matter? So why does being sustainable matter? And I'm really curious about your context in Greece. Um, I've been asking a few people whether this is relevant to you because of what's happening in your economy. But, you know, let's just explore as we go, because I think when you find out your own why, then you'll be able to bring it down into your own context. So in terms of the big picture, um, I heard a talk by Sir Bob Geldof, you know, the Save the World guy that did the record around the world for saving the world, saving Africa. I heard him speak at a conference on trust earlier this year, and what he said really resonated with me. He said, we're living in the 21st century, but our ideas and the way we view organizations is stuck in the 20th century. So I thought we'd start tonight by going back to what, what is it that we're stuck in? What's that 20th century paradigm that we're supposedly stuck in? That 
paradigm dates from the Industrial Revolution, and it's a mechanistic view of the world. It sees organizations as machines and people as cogs in those machines. It leads to a leadership style that's about controlling, planning, fixing things. So I'm just wondering about your experience of organizations and what impact that mechanistic view has had on that experience. So as I go through, I'll be posing those questions, hopefully to get you to reflect on how this has impacted on you. So there's a lady called Margaret Wheatley, you may have read some of her books, who writes a lot about organizations and leadership. And this quote here sums up what she believes are the consequences of viewing organizations as machines. And I think what she says there is quite interesting. She said it creates a treadmill environment where we can't realize our potential. So I asked myself, how did I feel when I was part of an organization that was viewed as being a machine and I was a cog in that machine and I was going to bring the box with me but I didn't think EasyJet would find it very easy to transport. So that's a picture of me with a box on my head because I think that's how I feel in an organization that viewed me as a cog in the machine. I'd feel boxed in. I wouldn't feel that I had any connection with the people in that organization. So that's the 20th century paradigm that we're supposedly stuck in. So let's now come back to the 21st century and think about the context that we're actually operating in. And we're in varying stages of post-financial crisis. And I know you're still well ensconced in your financial crisis. But I think what we've learned from that is that things will never go back to how they were and that we're dealing with a new normal in the 21st century. It's a whole new context. And there are lots of themes and trends I could have shared with you tonight, but I've picked out three to talk about, which I think have relevance to this idea of sustainably effective leadership. One of them, which we're all well aware of, is the speed of change. And that speed is going to continue increasing. So, what impact does that have on, on your life? The second one is the digital revolution. We probably all experience information overload every day. Apparently, in the last five years, there's been more information created than in the whole of human history. And that's going to continue to grow at 40% a year. So by 2020, there'll be 30 times more information than there is now. And the digital revolution also means that we're all connected via our mobile devices 24-7. So what impact does all of that have on your life? And then the final theme is low engagement. And I'm going to share some data with you. There's a lot of research being done in the UK that's shown that engagement has a massive impact on the financial performance of organizations. In fact, it's seen to be the most consistent predictor of business performance. And yet, levels of engagement are quite low. This global study conducted in 2014 by Towers Watson found that only 40% of people are highly engaged. In other words, they feel really associated with the organization and they're willing to give discretionary effort on its behalf. And you can see that 24% are actively disengaged. And that led me to explore, and this is quite a busy chart, but I'll pick out the key points, the drivers of high engagement from that study. And the top driver is effective leadership. And interestingly, within effective leadership, showing a genuine interest in the well-being of the employee is a key part of being an effective leader. And then the third key driver you can see there is about work workload and work-life balance. So both of those are relevant to what I want to talk about this evening. And it shows that if we're to have high engagement, organizations need to show that they care about the physical and the emotional well-being of their people. 
And there are some organizations that oh, I can't move that, can I? There are some organizations that are starting to think about well-being. Are any of you associated with organizations who are focusing on the well-being of their people? One or two. So there are organizations that are recognizing this and starting to do something about it. So if that machine paradigm, if that me mechanistic view of organizations is not relevant to the 21st century, what do we replace it with? Well, I think the natural replacement is viewing organizations and human beings as part of those organizations as living systems. It's about recognizing that we aren't machines, we aren't computers, we can't run continuously at high speeds, we can't run multiple programs at the same time. So it really is about recognizing that we're living systems, we have cycles, we need to be high performers, we need cycles of recovery. So it's really understanding about living systems. And the reason that the mechanistic view goes against this is that many of those organizations operating to that mechanistic view have a relentless drive for short-term financial goals. They consistently demand that their people work long hours. And I'm wondering what effect that's having on the living systems in those organizations. Would you agree with me that it's not sustainable for us as living systems to operate in those conditions? And it risks creating a culture of burnout. And you'll hear from my story later that I've actually burnt out myself. I've done it to myself, so I know what the consequences are. So let's consider burnout for a moment, um, if you can bear it. There was a study in the UK in 2013 amongst UK HR directors that found that one in three organizations is creating a climate that risks employees burning out. So just imagine the impact that would have on their family. And if research by, um, by what's the key university in the States, anyway, by a key medical research center in the US, United States, if that's to be believed, then all of us in this room are suffering at least some signs of burnout. So consider what impact that would have on your life if you burnt out. So I think what we have to recognize if we're working as coaches and leaders in organizations or even as leaders of our own lives, that it's just not sustainable to work long hours and to not take account of the needs of the living system that is our body. And I believe that leaders who create climates, because it's the leaders in organizations who create the climate, Leaders who create climates that risk themselves and their people burning out will not only be unfit to lead, they'll become obsolete and no longer fit in. So it's worth us recognizing that as coaches and finding ways of working with leaders to help them recognize this. So that led me to think about, well, if the definition of success, if that short-term definition of success of financial performance for the organization, of achieving financial goals for the leaders, is creating a climate of long hours and a climate of burnout. What's an alternative definition of success? And the first part is to recognize that organizations are living systems and we are living systems. But the second part is to recognize that we're all part of a wider system. We affect other parts of the system. So that led me to the triple context here, which shows that the, the wider system on which organizations depend for their survival and their success is made up of three parts. The natural environment, the social and political system, and the global economy. And if any of those parts of the system collapses, then it's likely that the other parts of the system will be affected. So we're all interdependent. So what's the definition of success that helps organizations to operate within that triple context? Well, there's a triple bottom line. This method of reporting already exists. There are already organizations who operate to people, planet, and profit. 
sometimes it's a little bit rhetorical at the top of the organization and doesn't actually flow through in their practices. But it's a good start of a more balanced scorecard and a more balanced definition of success for organizations. So that led me to think about what does that require of leaders? And I came up with that definition I, I referred to earlier. Um, I believe it does require a new breed of leader, a breed of leader who is aware, has the, that self-awareness of what they're doing for themselves, of the conditions they need for themselves, for themselves to thrive in. So it's a leader who can bring balance into their own lives. And it's a leader who can not only deliver sustainable high performance themselves, but they can create the conditions for their people to deliver sustainable high performance as well. So I thought about the leaders that I'd coached over the last 12 years. I looked at all of my coaching files, which, believe it or not, I've kept over the last 12 years, and had a look. What had I worked on with all of those leaders? What was it that they wanted in their lives? And funnily enough, it was another triple. It was a triple H this time. It was happiness, health, and the high performance that delivers success. So I don't think leaders are any different than any of the rest of us. They actually do want happiness, health, and high performance. And a couple of the people in the audience in London yesterday said, Sue, I've started to have conversations where leaders are saying to me that actually what they want, the difference they want to make as a leader is to create an environment in which people can be happy. It's one of the highest motivators that people want, and leaders are no different. So there's a different definition of performance I think we need to embrace for the 21st century. So that's the bigger picture, why it matters in terms of the 21st century context and the difference that leaders can make in the organizations that they work in in the 21st century. But I thought I'd share with you my own personal story as to why it matters to me. Prior to 2002, I was a company director and leader of my own business. I was one of those unbalanced leaders. I didn't have any balance in my life. I worked long hours. I had two young children, and I also had a husband at that time. And I tried to be the best in all areas of my life. But in reality, it was my work life that completely dominated. I told myself I was doing it for my kids, but who knows? I was on the treadmill anyway. And then if you were with me one morning in April in 2000, you'd see me in my smart Armani suit. It was dark outside, very early. I peeked in and waved goodbye to my little children asleep in their beds for the umpteenth time that month and set off with my suitcase in a taxi to the Brighton Conference Center in the south of England. I'd been invited to speak at my industry's national conference. As I stood at the podium, like this podium here, I realized that I didn't feel quite normal. I didn't feel quite right. So I delivered the speech. And normally, after the speech, I'd network and mingle with people. I'd listen to as many speeches as I possibly could and absorb as much knowledge and information as I could. But on this occasion, I said to myself, Susan, you're going to take some time for yourself. So I went back to my hotel room, had a lovely shower with the intention of lying on the bed, relaxing, reading a book. And in the shower, I noticed a lump on my breast couldn't quite believe it. I was superhuman. You know, I was invincible. I was the person racing around, working with all of these big organizations. How could I have anything wrong with me? So I got home from the conference, hospital visits, doctor's visits, and a diagnosis of breast cancer. Any of you had that sort of news delivered to you will know how difficult it is in that moment. It, it feels as if your body's let you down. It feels as if someone's betrayed you. But gradually you realize it's actually you who's betrayed yourself. The most difficult part was telling the children that I wasn't well. And 
seeing their worried faces as my appearance changed as all the hair fell out of the different parts of my body. And that was tough for them and for me. But there was a, a further part, a further turning point in this story. My oncologist was a very busy man. He was a leading oncologist. He had a private practice. He had a national health service practice. And he was juggling lots of balls. And he planned to take a holiday. So he made out the prescriptions for my chemotherapy in advance. And one of the drugs was a very powerful chemotherapy drug that you could only have every other cycle of chemotherapy. And he'd forgotten that. So after the next session of chemotherapy, my blood count absolutely plummeted through the ground. And I find myself now in a hospital room in isolation. My children can't come and see me. They're peering in, looking at nurses with white masks and aprons on. And I actually did think I was going to die in that moment. And in the conversation I had with myself, I recognized that there was just no balance in my life and things could not continue in that way. So I made a commitment to myself to live to see my grandchildren and to find a way of living that has more balance. I'm still here today, so, so far so good. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So I was lucky. I survived all of that. And I was also lucky because my business had an investment plan that it was planned to be sold shortly after that period. So in 2002, we sold the business, and I was able to exit the business with a, a small amount of money that gave me a bit of breathing space. And during that breathing space, I decided to train to be a coach mainly to help myself because divorce followed after the breast cancer and I needed a bit of help, frankly. So I thought coaching might be a good idea and I absolutely loved it. But one of the main reasons I'm a leadership coach is because I want to help the leaders that I work with to find their own definition of success that brings balance so that they don't have to have the wake-up call that I had. So that's why it matters to me. I now know that the definition of success that believes that overworking leads to outstanding results is flawed. And that success is not about striving and surviving in the way that I was. It's about thriving. So I want to find out why this matters to you. So on your Triple H tracker form, if you have a look at the bottom, you'll see why does it matter. Let me see what the exact words are. Your personal why. Why does being a sustainably effective leader matter to you? And I'd just like you to take a couple of minutes to reflect on that and to write your own personal why, whatever it is, for why it matters to have balance in your life and why being sustainably effective matters to you. So just take a moment to fill that part of the form in. So what I'd now like you to also do on the Triple H tracker is you can see there are three boxes, happiness, health and well-being, and sustainable high performance at work. Just give you a, yourself a score out of 10 in each of those boxes as to how satisfied you are with yourself currently for your happiness, your health and well-being, and your sustainable high performance at work. So take a moment to do that, and then we'll just share what's happening in the room in terms of balance. Okay, so we're going to start raising hands again. How many of you gave yourself eight or more in all three of those categories? Woo! So you're the role models 
You're going to role model this to everybody in your lives, so that's fantastic. How many of you think there's still room for improvement? Okay, so plenty to work on there. But hopefully that's a useful tool that you can use to help keep yourself on track. And I definitely have identified the pillars of sustainability for my life. And I know if I don't focus on them, I'll go out of balance. And maybe it's something if your coaches that you can start to try out with your clients and have conversations with them about how balanced they feel and what's their definition of success. So um, we are behind time. So I'm going to, I said what you could take away was a tool that you can use as well as some tips. So I'm going to whiz forward a little bit um, to talk about what can you do to maintain that new definition of success. And I'm particularly going to focus in on the health aspect. And within the health aspect, on brain health. I don't know whether brain health is something that any of you have ever considered. I certainly hadn't until quite recently. Um, but now I'm aware of it. I find myself searching around Athens for a nice green salad for lunch. And I'm, I'm very aware of what I'm doing and how I'm looking after my brain, particularly for this evening when I knew I had to talk to you. So I have been looking after my brain today. OK, so brain health. The key to brain health is neuroplasticity, and many of us as coaches are aware of some of this neuroscience. So what is neuroplasticity? We used to think that our brain was fixed once we became adult, and that it degenerated with age, but now we know it can constantly change and rewire itself. We can rewire those limiting beliefs. And so maintaining our brain health is about maintaining our neuroplasticity. And Probably as coaches, you already know this as well, that the, the hard wiring that influences our thinking and our behavior in our long-term memory is very often in place by the time we're seven years old. So as an adult, we have a seven-year-old running our lives. And nobody teaches us that we need to update it. We update the software on our laptops, but we, we don't update our own. <laughs> So our job as leaders of our own lives or leaders in organizations is to update our software and make sure that we have a healthy brain and we look, off, we look after our neuroplasticity. Not only will that help us to continue to learn and grow, but recent research has also shown that it helps prevent things like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So it's part of our job as chief exec of our own health and leader of our own life to look after our brains. It has long-term benefits. So Dr. Daniel Siegel developed five keys to neuroplasticity. And I'm very quickly going to run through them with you now, because these are things that you can do in your own life to maintain your neuroplasticity and your brain health. And the first one is to know where your learning edge is. And as coaches, we're very good at identifying that. So it's about getting out of your comfort zone, encouraging the people that you're coaching to get out of their comfort zone and to stretch themselves. Ooh. Let me go back. Um, why do we need to do that? Because being in our comfort zone, we use existing neural pathways. And to maintain our neuroplasticity, we need to create new neural pathways. And the way we do that is by doing things that we don't already know how to do. So, are you stretching yourself and getting out of your comfort zone? I hope so. <laughs> the second of the five keys is exercise. And we usually apply this to our physical well-being, if you like, and our physical fitness. Why is that important to brain health? Because the brain is 2 to 3% of our body weight, but consumes 20 to 25% of the oxygen and the calories. And movement and exercise gets more oxygen to the brain. So it helps in that way. So Daniel Siegel recommends 30 to 60 minutes three days a week. Are you scheduling that into your agendas? I don't quite manage that, but I go for two twice a week. The third key to neuroplasticity is attention. I don't know about you, but sometimes I do so many different things during the day. I get to the end of the day, and I wondered what on earth 
I've done. And neuroscience has shown that not even women can multitask. The brain doesn't like multitasking. Hard to admit, isn't it, girls? And it drains our energy. To switch from one thing to another during the day completely drains our energy. So we go home exhausted. And the reason it matters is because of the chemicals in our brains. If we don't give focus and attention to what we're doing, we don't create a protein in the brain that helps create those new neural pathways that help with our neuroplasticity. So that's why attention and focus and planning your day to enable that is important. The next one is rest, something we probably don't realize that we're lacking until we don't get it. I was up at 3 a.m. this morning and very aware about this one. And apparently, if we have only four hours sleep for four to five nights consecutively, it's the equivalent to being drunk at work. And a lot of organizations have rules about not drinking during the working day, but what do they do about lack of sleep? So we actually need seven to nine hours a night. I don't know about you, that's not that easy to fit in, is it? But I keep trying. And I have an online course that people enroll on, and I give them tips to help with their sleep. So I'm going to give you a couple of tips now. The first one is have an electronic sundown. I hope you're not one of the people that answers emails <coughs> at midnight or that has all your gadgets around your bed um, because that's not good. It stops, it keeps the cortisol levels high and it stops you sleeping, stops you getting rest. And all those indicator lights of all those devices, cover them up so that you can, your melatonin levels can increase sufficiently to give you a good sleep. And I'm sure many of you like me have stuff running around in your head just about the time you want to go to bed. So just do a brain dump on a piece of paper or keep that by the bed. If you wake at four like I do, just get it on that piece of paper and let go of it so that you can get your seven to nine hours sleep. And the final of the five keys is nutrition. And we usually apply that again to our whole physical health. What matters to the brain to help with neuroplasticity and to stop cell damage and aging of the brain is that we have an alkaline diet. So acidity causes inflammation. And inflammation causes brain fog. Have you ever had a big carbohydrate lunch and then suddenly thought after lunch, oh my God, you know, I really, I've got foggy brain, I can't think straight. So I'm going to give you three tips in terms of nutrition for the brain. Plenty of green vegetables, plenty of fruit and vegetables, basically. Good fats, those omega-3s that you get in all that lovely olive oil that you have over here in avocados. I'm sure your Mediterranean diet is very brain healthy. And carbohydrates and sugar really limited within your diet. So I don't think we've got time now. I can't see my watch. Oh, maybe we have. What I'd like you to do now on the Triple H tracker under the health box is write down one thing that you'd like to commit to for yourself that you're going to hold yourself accountable to, to improve or maintain, if you had one of those eight plus scores, your score in terms of health on that Triple H tracker. So I'll give you a, I'll give you a moment just to write that down and then we'll bring the talk to a conclusion. Okay, so she seems to be a theme of the evening, doesn't she, Maya Angelou? And so think about your definition of success. Where does happiness, health, and sustainable high performance fit in your definition of success? Is it a definition of success that's relevant to the 21st century? And I think this is one definition of success that's really relevant for the 21st century. It's about liking yourself about liking what you do and liking how you do it. Thank you.